Hi, and I'm Ashley Gordon. And we are back with another episode of Reading for the Rest of Us. Uh, it's been a while. It has. We took the summer off. We took a bit of a sabbatical from the show because why? Why did, why did we do that? It was hot. It was hot. We had other things to do. Work called. Well, we read a lot. But we did. We were very active we were busy in, reading. In, in terms of reading. So we thought we would do uh, a show because um, just recently we lost a huge uh, writer that we both love very much and have been uh, fans of for quite a while. Do you want to tell us? We did. August 20th, we lost Elmore Leonard. He was a prolific writer and one who turns out to have influenced quite a lot of the writers that that are on the bestseller list yeah. and um, it, it, many people commented on his passing and his work and their their favorites of his and uh, we we thought with what 40 novels and countless short stories and movie screenplays and other things to his credit he was worth the show on his yeah. own it's interesting when the eulogies started coming out and people were uh, commenting to see the range of um, critics and just everyday readers who were sort of mourning his passing. And I think for someone to have sustained a, a 60 year career um, is a really uh, remarkable accomplishment. But I think it also people are reacting to sort of the passing of, a, of an opportunity to have that kind of career in some ways. And I think uh, what Elmore Leonard represented for a lot of writers was the idea that you could be constantly commercially prolific and uh, just sort of the endless number of books he could we don't want to use the word churn because that makes it sound you know you, we were talking earlier and you said he was never like James, James Patterson, Patterson. Right. yeah or um, you know these authors that kind of hire books out there are some that seem to create a factory around their right. work and uh, it, you know, they, they get these book deals and there's one book a year and yeah. for two or three years in a row and you do get the sense that they are writing to a deadline as opposed to writing for the love of writing. Right. And I think the stories of Elmore Leonard and how he got started and, and the interviews with him where he talks about being a writer, he may have been writing to a deadline, but he was writing because he couldn't not write. Right. And for there's one idea of the writer, the sort of hard drinking, uh, romantic image, the Hemingway and the Fitzgerald, and you write between bouts of lovesickness or hangovers. And then there's the other writer who's the romantic notion of being a writer, which I think is a little more ours, a little more yeah. modern, which is the Elmore Leonard, although at the same degree it is passing. Yeah. Um, he started as a, an, a in marketing, right. advertising, mm -hmm. he's writing copy and between sitting at his desk writing copy for the Chevrolet, it was Chevrolet, it was, yeah, it was Detroit. Yeah, the Detroit auto industry. Right, because he's mm -hmm. from Detroit which you can't miss um, right. in reading his books. So he, I remember hearing that he had this um, this drawer, one of like the old timey flat right. um, little shelf that he would pull out, and he'd be writing over here while he was doing something else over here, so that it wouldn't know, so that his boss couldn't see that he was constantly writing short stories because yeah. that was all he wanted to be. We actually have a, a picture of what he looked like back in the fifties when he oh, was wow. when he was uh, clean -cut doing he that. Yeah, long before he sort of grew the trademark beard and everything, and. Uh, it's a, a pretty interesting, you know, he was known, the folks at the advertising agency, he worked there throughout the 50s, left right in 1960, and then ended up, ended up uh, uh, freelancing, really for another decade before he could support himself. But, um, you know, clearly the folks at the agency were kind of proud to have this successful novelist whose books after were he getting... After he was successful. <laughs> yeah, well, while he was there even, because this is them celebrating oh, him great. during, well, during good for this them period. for recognizing yeah, this it. This is their trade, one of their trade magazines, and sort of talking about how, uh, you know, one of their writers was writing westerns that were getting turned into movies. It's was it two cents a word that he would get yeah, in those that early was about stories? Yeah, that was about the going rate. You know, he really, I think in some ways people really treasure him uh, that first decade of Western writing because he came in right at the tail end of the pulps and he's writing for Argosy and Western stories and these kind of 
magazines that because of the advent of television were on their way out as he's starting. So and if you bookend it, you've got Dashiell Hammett at the beginning, mm -hmm. who we've talked about right. before and is a favorite of both of ours, and Elmore Leonard at the end. Right. Um, and by that time, I, I have not read the westerns. I dip in later with the crime novels, yeah. but um, he, he does that have that intensity of Dashiell Hammett and that great dialogue and the ability to create an environment, but something that he had that I don't remember reading in, in Hammett is humor. Yeah, well that's very true. Funny. Uh, very true, and in fact there's a great line where he talks about how when he started out writing he very much admired Hemingway and wanted to write like Hemingway until he discovered or realized that Hemingway has no sense of humor. <laughs> so. <None. laughs> But uh, yeah, I think the I think the humor came along as he became a crime novelist or a thriller writer. The westerns are not quite as uh, as humorous, but they do tap into that sort of mythic America, and it's kind of funny to see his attitude toward them as he switched more and more to crime. There was a great line where they asked him, "How did you in Detroit imagine these western frontiers?" And he said, "Oh, I subscribed to Arizona Highways and just." You know, they had they had good copy, and I just, you know, borrowed images out of those. And so. used my imagination. Exactly. Well, and Go that's figure. it. That's it perfectly. Did, uh, are the westerns as tightly written with the dialogue as the later novels? Yeah, Did they you? are. They don't have that sort of razzmatazz, that sort of back and forth, the repartee that we, we tend to think of. They're classic westerns in the sense that, you know, it's men that are tight-lipped, and, you know, you don't, you don't waste a word, and... You know, you don't have the sort of, for for lack of a better word, when you, once he gets into the Detroit books, is the kind of funkiness of the dialogue yeah. that we think of, and it's not just kind because of a, a street attitude, right, right. There's none and of a that color in there. To it. But there is a sort of, there is a sort of, uh, you know, a very mythic sort of westernness uh, to it. Probably, oddly enough, the most famous western story is the last one that he did, or the last uh, sort of his goodbye to the genre. And it came in the 80s when he was asked to contribute a story. This was for a story called The Tonto Woman. And uh, it's the last uh, story in the, the collected westerns that he did. But it was based on a very famous image that has been handed down to us in history. And those of you that watch television will recognize probably that, that the television show Hell on Wheels has borrowed this image as well, even though that's not associated with Elmore Leonard. But uh, Tonto Woman is about a woman who, uh, a wife who is abducted by uh, a, a Native American tribe and is tattooed and scarred. And, and uh, it's about her re-entry back into uh, 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 white society and how she's not accepted. And of course, there's one hero who, who does accept her. So it's a it's a really neat story. It's it, you don't have to be a Western fan to like it. So that might be the one that you might the one to start. Check Does it with. is it written from her perspective or from no. the? Uh -uh. He doesn't write from the woman's yeah. perspective. I noticed. Well, I saw a quote once where except for maybe in Rum Punch. Yeah, I saw a quote once where they said that uh, um, that you know he read a review where he said all his characters were like M Mickey Spillane women, and he took offense to that, and he really didn't think that was true, so it was sort of after that that he began to conscientiously try to develop characters. Karen Sisko is probably his best female character, and I think those novels and stories work pretty well from they do. a, from a like woman's her. perspective. She's in some of the stories, but most famously in Out of Sight. And uh, you, you were a fan of the TV show. I did. I loved the TV show. Yeah, I thought it, she was it, funny. It was unfortunate that was that it did not last longer. I think it. I think if it had been on cable, it it would have had a <laughs> or a, on Netflix. If I could have gotten the entire season at sure. once, we'd now have season five of Karen yeah. Um You know, it's also people. The the other Western connection there is sort of the modern day lawman, and people. A lot of people have been turned on to Elmore Leonard lately because of the the show Justified, which is based on um, Pronto and writing the rap. Uh, I have to admit, I kind of like the TV show a lot better than I like the books. I think the TV show has found a way to be almost be more Elmore Leonard than he was, than he in, was. The, in, in those books. Fire in the Hole was the first story that he used, Raylan Givens, who's a, a deputy U.S. marshal. 
but um, is that the same Raylan that shows up in this last yeah the last yeah. book that he, he published actually the, the the last one he did before his death was Raylan which is a, a, a storyline that he conceived to kind of help publicize or go along with the TV show and that's why it has Timmy Timothy Oliphant on the on the cover there. he is a rem remarkable writer in the way he is connected to pop culture, mm -hmm. movies, television sure. shows, he incorporates it into his storylines. It's funny to be reading Get Shorty, a book about making a movie, and then watch the movie about a book about making a movie. I mean, the, the, yeah. it becomes self-reflexive after a while, and, and he's, it, it almost feels kind of tongue-in-cheek when he's doing it with all these references to actors. And um, on the one hand, you get the sense that he really enjoyed movies. Yeah. They were just fun for but him. But he hated Hollywood. But hated Hollywood. Um, but it also works within the story. It's not gratuitous. And yeah. there aren't many writers, I think, that can do that. He somehow has a sense of humor, but is also an incredibly talented writer right. at the same time. You were telling me a story earlier that I had not heard before about the, the writing of the Get Shorty sequel, which is called Be Cool, which is another one that sort of developed first as a screenplay and then he can't, turned around and wrote the novel. But you were saying, in terms of this pop culture reference, you know, we tend to think of writers being born in their time and their frame of reference sticks in their time and they don't necessarily go out and learn new stuff. But you were saying in Be Cool, he actually ran around with a fairly famous rock band. Well, I saw an interview with him and he was talking about hanging out with Aerosmith as research for for his writing right. and he was laughing at himself at his age um, although he can't be that much older than than uh, certainly doesn't look a whole lot older than <laughs> most of those Aerosmith guys. Maybe he hasn't lived quite as yeah. rough um, they've aged prematurely yeah. but but he again he so obviously enjoyed learning about the music and the life of being on the road and being in the band and he was talking about using that in conversation with his kids and his grandkids and he he seems to have retained a, a sense of being curious mm -hmm. about the world. Um, and even though his books can be incredibly dark, it, and they are violent at times, he doesn't seem dark. No. The, the ultimate, even though these horrible things happen, it's kind of like watching The Sopranos, so those, mm -hmm. those could get dark. Yeah. But, or, or even Quentin Tarantino, who did one of the movies, right. who took Rum Punch and made Jackie Brown. You find yourself laughing at these things that really are not funny, and somehow yeah. he makes the dark not so scary. I think one sense. of the reasons for that is he latched on to a very basic idea that really runs counter to a lot of our interest in thrillers and crime novels, and that's he, he genuinely believed that most criminals are stupid. And I think he focused on a lot of the lower level. That was actually a line. Sort of, sort of criminals. Um, I've been listening to Djibouti, one of his recent books, and um, I just heard them say that. One character says, Why do all these bad guys take themselves so seriously? Dara says that, and Xavier answers her, Because they're stupid. Yeah. Um, and. So he does seem to make the crook not right. the s sharpest tool in the shop. And I think that's part of where the, uh, you know, the humor comes, but it also leavens the darkness of it. Uh, it's interesting because one of the first ones I remember reading, and I discovered uh, Elmore Leonard really in the late 70s um, with Mr. Majestic, which was a Charles Bronson movie, and 52 Pickup, which became a movie in the, in the 80s. But one of my favorite ones uh, came out right as I went to college was called Stick and it had been the character had reappeared had first appeared in the 70s and I love a, these moments a, when you so clearly age yourself as older than I am well, I don't have I, a clue what you're talking that's, about that's what I'm that's what I'm here for I feel so young the, when uh, you do this but there was a book called Swag in the 70s which I didn't read till much later but I did pick up <laughs> Stick when it came out okay. and um, you know it's a, a kind of funny book uh, the the version that I've I have is a, a terrible Heinous. '80s cover. Looks like a Judith Krantz right, version of El, Elmore Leonard, but it's a it's a neat book because it's a caper book and it's got all those elements of of uh, you know uh, a sort of uh, cartoonish villains. Uh, all pill heads or all bad gangsters. See, how can you make the villain to in some ways the central figure? Yeah, but. 
and likable, somebody that you're willing to spend 200, 300 pages with, but not somebody you want to be like. Right. That's a pretty fine distinction yeah. and a hard thing to do as a writer. And I think the flip side of it is, is when you do try to write heroic characters nowadays, they tend to be a little boring because they don't have that sort of scamp quality that a lot of his uh, main characters have. Well, a lot of his good guys, I mm -hmm. think, have this little edge of, yeah. of being just outside the lines. Right. It's like the Clooney character that, that uh, from Out of Sight that reappears in Road Dogs. Who would be lovable few, even if he weren't Clooney. Yeah, but well, and I mean, that's <laughs> that it exactly. Is you, you, don't, you have a bad guy who's uh, by definition a criminal or a crook, but he's, he's also a scamp. But and they're he's distinctions. Lovable. Yeah. They're criminals who kill, who kill people. Right, right. And I guess they're criminals who kill bad people. Yeah. And, and then I, there are criminals who don't kill anybody. And I think some of the heroic guys are kind of caught in scams that don't, that, that aren't of their making. They're not, they may be, they may, they may be capable of bad things and go to jail, but they're not amoral themselves. They have an, their own, own moral code. Again, it's, it's, uh, it goes back to the idea, I think, of, of uh, finding the humor, finding the sort of absurdity in the violence. Uh, when, St when Stick was made into a movie in a couple years after, and it was done as a Burt Reynolds movie, it's one of the worst movies ever made out of his books. And all because, you know, it lost the entire edge of humor. And it's so funny because the, the movie is so laughable because the main villain is a, is a pillhead drug dealer who's kind of zonked out, but Burt Reynolds has Charles Durning. Remember Charles Durning sort of tubby, mm -hmm. perpetually 65, 70-year-old actor, uh, but they put him in an orange wig. Uh, and it that's just, impossible it, to yeah, envision. It just, it, it's crazy. Uh, it, it just is so bizarre. That's and a really it scary so place totally to go. tanks the entire movie. Yeah. But, uh, well, in, in Get Shorty, which is the book about making movies, he, he bashes Hollywood yeah. for doing exactly that. Right, right. Um, when, when the characters who are in the movie business talk about what's wrong with Hollywood and what's wrong with movies, that's what they talk mm -hmm. about. So it's interesting that he's using his books to Vent. speak. Yeah. yeah, he was venting in a lot to of ways. To respond. Uh, you know, but you don't feel that. It's not heavy-handed. Yeah, yeah. You know, he doesn't seem bitter about it. It's kind of like no, he's still, rolling his still eyes. Funny. But it's interesting because, you know, there, there have been almost two dozen movies made based on his books. And quite honestly, maybe a third of those are good. The, the most famous, uh, most of his book adaptations are famous for being terrible. So it's interesting that there's something there. What are the terrible a, but, ones? Well, um, Stick is one. Right. They recently made a version of uh, uh, one of one of his most beloved books from the 80s called Freaky Deaky, which is a kind of 60s radical in the 70s book. And, you know, they so totally just bizarre it up. It, it, it's almost That seems impossible. so unnecessary. Yeah. His books are written almost like screenplays. Why not? And they work. They're, yeah. they're, they're so popular. Why wouldn't you just do Here, book? Here's a good example of why he had to roll his eyes at the situation. The first crime novel he did was in 1969, I think, The Big Bounce. Okay. which is another kind of caper movie. It I came out right away as a movie with uh, Ryan O'Neill. And uh, yeah, 69, and, very and good. The year just, I was born. Just a big dud. So 2004, they remake The Big Bounce. Uh, elements of the same story, but really a different script. And uh, Was for, it called The Big Bounce? Yeah. yeah. Never heard of for it. For all of those uh, 25 years, it's Owen, Owen Wilson and I think Samuel, uh, or uh, not Samuel Jackson, but uh, Morgan Freeman. But for 25 years, he said, uh, he said it, The Big Bounce was the worst movie ever made in Hollywood. And then he came back and, no, he said it was the second worst movie ever made in Hollywood without ever identifying the first one. So then they made The Big Bounce and he said, you know, the, 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 it's the second worst movie ever made in Hollywood except for the remake. Wow, so that's brutal. He was, uh, well, Out of Sight was good. Yeah. Get Shorty was great. Yeah. It those, was so funny. Those two and Jackie Brown are usually considered the top. The good ones. Th Jake really doesn't like Jackie three. Brown. Really? Uh-uh. Interesting. Um, you know, I think when Jackie Brown first came out as a movie, everybody so expected Pulp Fiction 2 that it has a whole different vibe to it, and it really is that sort of mellower. 
Very mellow. Uh, Elmore Leonard vibe. I loved it. I do too. And uh, honestly, it's my favorite Tarantino movie that he's done in part because well, it's one of the ones you can get through without feeling like yeah. you need to take a shower at there's the end. a lot less of him in it than there is right. uh, it's, or, or sort of his you in know, fact he's not even in it right right um i think you know the movie has some advantages over the novel because people are sort of shocked when they pick up uh rum punch which is the novel that it's based on and discover that uh in the book jackie brown is not jackie brown little right and caucasian yep. and blonde right and right. i think changing that the way they did in the movie is what made the movie yeah. and the uh, sort of the relationship that develops and i kept as i'm reading the book i'm sorry I'm interrupting. That's all right. as i'm reading the book i kept having to do this mental slide show thing because yeah. I'm seeing her because right. she was so perfect Pam Greer yeah she was fantastic yeah. Yeah. and the relationship that develops between her and Robert Forrester as the bail bondsman Max I think really captured an element of romance that's not in that many it's not Tarantino in, movies and it's not really in the book either yeah no and that's a good point you know it's interesting because Rum Punch was actually another one of these novels that sort of re cycled characters from an early one yeah but wait wait before we get to okay. that because we'll get there but this brought up a moment between us where we had a role reversal okay as you keep flipping back and forth between accurately identifying the book as rum punch and the movie as jackie brown uh, when elmore leonard died and there were the uh, obituaries and the requisite list of works in many cases, the book was listed as Jackie Brown, yeah, yeah. not Rum Punch. And you had a slight rant on Facebook about it. And I had to be the one to say, come on, let it go. Dutch wouldn't care. That's Why right. do we care? Letting it go is not my normal modus operandi. So anyway, we had that little that switch. That was an interesting moment. Yeah, because like normally you're the laid back one and I'm the normally climb up on the soapbox kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, but where we were headed was the re- appearance of right. characters from one story to another yeah. which is a very common device that he uses but this was actually one of the first uh elmore leonard's that i ever read and this was again i'm gonna date myself you would have been about 10 or 11 when i read this uh i wouldn't have necessarily been all that much older just just to reassure you but this this is part of the reason it was books like this that i think i sort of fell in love with them because they they're fun but there is that sort of 70s vibe to him where it's just sort of, you know, there is an element of laid back uh, you know quality what it is? to these crimes. Okay, remember in the first Ocean movie, mm -hmm. Ocean's Eleven, and the George Clooney character shows up to pick up the Brad Pitt character who's coming out of prison. And George Clooney said, looks at him and says, Ted Nugent called, he wants his suit back, right? Do you yep. remember how mm -hmm. Brad Pitt looks? That kind, that whole laid back, cool, yes, my lapels are out to my shoulders, right. and I know that this is a little bit on the, I don't know, geeky, over the top, cheesy side, yeah. but I can pull it off. Yep. yep. Don't you think that's kind of the yeah, vibe you get from yeah. his crime And novels? the word cool is the one that you really nailed they there. They are. They're just, and it, in the re I mean, it's not overused. Yeah. When he yeah. used it in his book, be cool. It, it it's is. interesting when Chili he, Palmas when he was that. making that be transition cool. from westerns to crime fiction, one of the books that really influenced him was uh, George V. Higgins, uh, The Friends of Eddie uh, Coyle. Um, and it's interesting to reread that book and reread Elmore Leonard at the same time because I, I think again, Elmore Leonard had that had just that sort of cool vibe to him, you know. He, he you know, <laughs> he doesn't the, really the, look the, like it. Yeah, and he, he does. Show the picture no. of um, the progression. Oh, uh, the the Elmore Leonard throughout the years. Yeah. The different and he different faces. It's, it's not like he's the antithesis of cool, yeah. but cool is not the first word. That well, you look at that mind. middle picture there. That was the cover like of professor. Newsweek in 1985 when Glitz came out, and that was sort of his big breakthrough where his book sort of went off into the stratosphere. He's 60 years old at that point, turn, coming in on 60. Okay. But I love that picture because you're exactly right. He looks like some fuddy-duddy professor. He doesn't look like... You know, he doesn't, it doesn't look, look like the person who wrote these books. Right, right. Like if you go see Dennis Lehane, I saw Dennis Lehane speak this summer. He looks like a Boston guy. I mean, he looks like somebody. Did who he look like that before, novels. or is that his no, persona? No, I think that was him. 
I think that was, I think that's his character. Okay, would now um, be a good time to introduce what he wrote? Sure. When Elmore Leonard died? I think Because that, that was when, I've never read Dennis Lehane. Oh, okay. I know. Eh. Um, but he's, the, they scare me a little bit. Um, they're really dark. Well, and They're he, really violent. He yeah. seems to go a little further yeah. than. He doesn't have that, he doesn't necessarily aim for that cool vibe. But what did Dennis Lehane say? One of the biggest, he's referring to Elmer Leonard, one of the biggest influences in my own work, if not the biggest, which makes me want to go read Dennis Lehane. He was one of our most underrated satirists mm -hmm. and social commentators and the most influential game-changing crime novelist of the last several decades. And then, of course, what we all know, when it came to writing dialogue, he sat on the mountaintop while the rest of us wandered in the valley. He's truly irreplaceable, and the world is poor for his leaving it. Yeah. I mean, that was very personal. Mm -hmm. And it makes me, as I said, want to go read Dennis Lehane. But here's the piece of this that I think is the real interesting nugget. One of our most underrated satirists and social commentators. Yeah. Well, Because we haven't talked about that aspect of yeah. his work at all. Well, I think that's where a lot of the comedy comes from, and the making fun of Hollywood and sort of the crassness of, of some of these money-grabbing criminals or the crooked crooked lawyers. Yeah, but he's really political, too. Yeah. Um, Djibouti is about pirates, um, the, on like Somali Somalian pirates, shore, yeah. um, and then terrorism and al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot about gun running. There's a lot about what prison does and how people change right. from when they go in to when they come out. Cuba Libra was all about um, the history of America and colonialism and the effects of the war. Now, it's a fantastic story yeah. and historical fiction, and, and, but the blowing up of the main and, right. and whether or not the war was engineered. And as I'm reading it, thinking about current politics, it was amazingly relevant. So there's, there was a lot of politics mm -hmm. in what he wrote. That's really interesting. I hadn't thought of that idea before, but it makes, it makes us wonder if there's not, that's, that's maybe the, the next big thing that needs to be talked about him was his, was his uh, political sensibility and how these, for all the sort of facade of cool and, and funk in these books. He's presenting characters and giving them what's presumably an authentic voice that often don't get one right for this little bitty white guy yeah and he was kind of you know little mm -hmm. bitty white guy he was remarkable in the diversity of the ethnicity of the characters yeah. and they're not caricatures i don't think yeah um, no i don't think so either i think he found a way to write in those other voices and and to really to really um, bring them to life um, you're not going to believe this, but we are almost out of time, and we would be remiss if we didn't talk about very quickly. Uh, uh, Elmore we would. Leonard's One of the things that makes him great that he shared. Right. His so ten rules of writing. Tell me your favorite of the ten rules. Which is the one? <laughs> which is the one that you think is the most? Well, they're they're really funny. Mm -hmm. um, so not only are they true, but they're right. And he's you know never open a book with the weather. Right. Well, okay, just start there. Yeah. Um, my personal favorite is limit yourself to two exclamation points for every 100,000 words of prose. So, so that means that you can't use 16 exclamation points in a two-sentence email. Yeah. Um, so in, unless you're Tom Wolfe, he says, and then you can do that. <laughs> my favorite is leave out the parts that readers are going to skip, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> it's pretty good advice. We all know that we... We tend to dash through a lot of detail or descriptions. So this has been a fun conversation. Well, he's, good there's to, so much to talk about. Yeah. He's great. Well, it's good to be back and good to, good to have these Summer's conversations. Over. Yep, time to back to work. So we will see you in our next episode where we'll get to talk about books some more. So thank you for sitting with us. And as always, read a good book.